Hello, my name is Rob Sands. I'm a partner in the law firm of Hepler Broom. And I'd like to speak with you today about some recent developments in asbestos litigation. Today, Hepler Broom employs approximately 135 attorneys among the five offices who serve clients in more than 30 practice groups, uh, which include drug and medical device, appellate, cybersecurity, class action, construction, white collar criminal defense, asbestos and toxic tort, personal injury, premises liability, and a multitude of other practices. Hepler Broom's toxic tort practice group consists of approximately 60 attorneys and 50 paralegals between three primary offices, Chicago, Edwardsville, Illinois, and the city of St. Louis. Hepler Broom is not limited to representing clients in just Illinois and Missouri. We also represent asbestos clients in Wisconsin, Indiana, Minnesota, and California. A um, little background on me, I am licensed to practice and uh, maintain an active trial docket in Illinois, Missouri, and California. I have practiced business litigation for more than 20 years and have been practicing in asbestos litigation since 1999. I'd like to talk with you today about some recent developments in asbestos litigation. Uh, some of them are impacting on fundamental rights, some impact on affirmative defenses, and all should be considered in developing your litigation strategy in asbestos cases. The first area I'd like to talk about uh, is a recent change to six-person juries in Illinois. Juries historically, both in Illinois and throughout the United States, consisted of 12 panel members. However, in late 2014, uh, a Senate bill was enacted and signed by the governor, which limited the number of jurors to six in civil cases. Specifically, the amendment to 735 ILCS 5-2-1105 states, all jury cases shall be tried by a jury of six. For cases filed prior to June 1, 2015, if a party has paid for a jury of 12, that party may demand a jury of 12 upon proof of payment. For any cases after the June 1, 2015 date, the defendant was specifically limited to a jury of six. That, as I said before, it was enacted at the 11th hour of the legislative session and was signed by Governor Quinn shortly before leaving office. And it fundamentally changed the law in Illinois, which had existed since at least 1818 and had survived unchanged throughout six constitutional conventions. The six-person jury amendment was recently challenged in the case of Caicos versus Butler, which was a medical malpractice case filed in Cook County, Illinois. And after much argument, uh, in December of 2015, Judge William Gomolinsky uh, of the Circuit Court in Cook County ruled that the amendment was unconstitutional. He based that in part on the historical right to a jury of 12 and that that right had survived through all six of the Illinois Constitutional Conventions unchanged, that the legislature was attempting to exercise power that had been exclusively reserved for the judiciary under the Illinois Constitution, and the public policy favors maintaining 12-member juries by increasing the amount of diversity and the opportunity for uh, difference of opinions in the community, achieving a more just and fair result. Judge Gomolinsky's ruling is currently under review by the Illinois Supreme Court. In the event anyone is interested, uh, I have a copy of the 27-page trial court opinion that I'm happy to share, and my contact information is available at the end of this presentation. The next area I'd like to discuss is uh, recent changes in the workers' compensation exclusivity area. As most of us know, uh, an employer is entitled to uh, assert work comp exclusivity in cases where an employee is injured on the job or in functions related to the job. However, that was recently challenged and uh, this line of litigation ensued. Uh, the FOLTA case is important because in FOLTA, the plaintiff worked for Ferro Engineering in the 1960s to 1970. Uh, during that time, he was exposed to asbestos-containing products and developed later on uh, mesothelioma as a result of his alleged asbestos exposure. That disease was diagnosed in 2011, and in 2011, he then filed his claim in civil court. 
Uh, Faro Engineering, as you might imagine, raised work comp exclusivity at the trial court, and Judge Maddox, who was the presiding judge of the law division at that time and the presiding asbestos judge in Cook County, granted that motion. Plaintiff appealed, and the Court of Appeals reversed Judge Maddox. The Court of Appeals focused on the potential exceptions to the work comp exclusivity provision, in particular the fourth, which is that the injury is not compensable under the Act. The Court of Appeals went on to find that if an employee first learns of his injury after the expiration of the statute of repose that's contained within the Act, the employee has a right to proceed outside of the workers' compensation system and may sue his or her employer in the tort system. On appeal, the Illinois Supreme Court reversed the appellate court decision, specifically stating that since 1956, this court has held that despite limitations on the amount and type of recovery under the Act, the Act is the employee's exclusive remedy for workplace injuries. The Supreme Court also noted that though no fault of the employee, the right to seek recovery under the Act was extinguished before the claim accrued because the statute of repose does not mean that the Acts have no application and that the plaintiff was then free to bring his action in tort. To the contrary, uh, any type of work-related injury that falls within the potential scope of the Workers' Compensation Act or the Occupational Disease Act is governed exclusively by those provisions. The court noted that sometimes harsh results may apply in asbestos exposure cases such as this. However, they noted that it is up to the legislature to make those decisions, not the court, and that the court's responsibility is to interpret the law, not create the law. The next area I'd like to discuss are recent changes to the Illinois Construction Statute of Repose. The Construction Statute of Repose, as most of us know, uh, applies to any actions brought against others in the design, planning, observation, management, or construction of an improvement to real property that's brought after 10 years. The purpose behind that is to uh, bar suits for original construction activities. And historically, it has protected premises owners and contractors who purchased or used asbestos or asbestos-containing products on their premises after a 10-year period has elapsed. However, the Illinois statute, construction statute of repose was amended in late 2014, adding subsection F, which effectively eliminates any defense in the case of asbestos exposure. Now, this is not limited to refineries or steel mills or power plants or other heavy industrial sites. This potentially applies to any building and any new construction process on a building that resulted in asbestos exposure or potential asbestos exposure. The enactment was again at the 11th hour of the legislative session and was signed by Governor Quinn just prior to him leaving office. And unfortunately it eliminates one of the strongest defenses that premises owners and contractors have available to them in asbestos exposure cases. Similarly, the Indiana statute of repose is another issue that we need to discuss. Just last month on March 2nd, the Indiana Supreme Court ruled that the 10-year Indiana statute of repose for products was unconstitutional. And this is important because in a number of asbestos cases, both in northern Illinois and in southern Illinois, the individual plaintiffs may have had work history or exposures at locations in Indiana, in some cases exclusively in Indiana. Historically, we were able to challenge those cases based on the Indiana statute of repose and uh, get those cases dismissed. Unfortunately, that is now no longer a, an affirmative defense available to asbestos defendants. Personal jurisdiction is another hot topic in asbestos litigation. As many of you know, recently the U.S. Supreme Court in the Daimler versus Bauman decision held that in order for a defendant to have general jurisdiction in a particular state, that defendant must have its principal place of business or place of incorporation in that jurisdiction. Having your principal place of business or place of incorporation in a particular jurisdiction, according to the Supreme Court, effectively renders that defendant at home in that jurisdiction. Understandably, a number of defendants have raised personal jurisdiction in asbestos litigation, but the application has been inconsistent. For example, looking at Madison County, uh, there was one case, the Voss case, where the defendant presented uh, its personal jurisdiction motion and that motion to dismiss was granted. In contrast, just shortly afterward in the Jeffs case, 
uh, the court denied Ford Motor Company's motion to dismiss based on per lack of personal jurisdiction. Uh, there, the court found that Ford had manufacturing facilities in Illinois, uh, specifically in the Chicago area, had had those facilities for 40 to 50 years, had over 5,500 employees in Illinois, and in the four years preceding the motion, had invested approximately $500 million in Illinois. As a result, the court found that those were substantial and not de minimis contacts with the state of Illinois, sufficient in the court's opinion to render uh, Ford at home for purposes of personal jurisdiction and for that motion. My understanding is that that has not been challenged on appeal. However, this is a developing area of asbestos litigation and one that definitely needs to be monitored. Also, if a defendant is going to exercise personal jurisdiction as a defense, they also need to consider where that case is likely to go and whether that is a more favorable or less favorable jurisdiction from a defense standpoint. Lastly, I'd like to talk about forum nonconvenience in asbestos litigation. Uh, the trial courts have had somewhat inconsistent application and in this particular situation we'll look at Cook County for four recent examples showing that inconsistency. Uh, the first case, the Larson case, involved a plaintiff who was a Wisconsin resident who was allegedly exposed to asbestos in Wisconsin who sought medical treatment in Wisconsin and who only lived in Cook County for a brief period of time. Uh, the court in analyzing that situation determined that in fact the case should be dismissed as Wisconsin was a more convenient forum and more appropriate. Just a month later in the Wagner case the Cook County Circuit Court was confronted with a motion to transfer based on forum nonconvenience to one of the collar counties in northern Illinois, uh, specifically to Kane or McHenry County. The court was confronted with sort of a mixed bag in that situation, that the plaintiff had had some medical treatment in Cook County, uh, witnesses were scattered throughout northern Illinois, and uh, that felt that there was not a more appropriate county uh, than Cook County, and the case stayed the motion was denied. In the Peterson case, uh, which preceded the Wagner and Larson cases, uh, a, an interstate motion to dismiss based on forum nonconvenience in favor of Utah was granted. And then uh, subsequently in September of 2015, the Startley case uh, involved a motion to dismiss based on forum nonconvenience to Alabama, which was denied. The body of law surrounding forum nonconvenience in asbestos litigation is continuing to develop and it definitely should be part of your litigation strategy, but you need to understand that the courts have been inconsistent in its application and that also needs to be factored into your overall analysis. I'd like to thank the Illinois Manufacturers Association for the opportunity to speak on these issues today. Uh, my partners at Hepler Broom and I are always available to help should you have an issue related to asbestos, toxic tort litigation, or in any other area, uh, please feel free to contact me at the information listed on the slide. Uh, email is probably the best, but I always welcome phone calls as well. You can reach me at rhs at heplerbroom.com. And if you would like to have copies of any of the cases that we've discussed here today, I'd be more than happy to provide you with copies of those as well. Thank you very much.